Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the fourth installment of How Do You Solve a Problem Like Mikado, co-presented by Intermountain Opera Bozeman and the Bozeman Public Library. My name is Susan Miller, and I am the General Director of Intermountain Opera Bozeman. Before we get started, I want to thank our partner in this webinar, Bozeman Public Library, along with the library's Head of Adult Learning and Outreach, Corey Sloan, who has been instrumental in bringing this presentation to you tonight. Corey will be helping with the Q&A session at the end of the webinar, and you will meet her then. Over the past several weeks, we at Intermountain Opera have been asked, why are we adapting Gilbert and Sullivan's classic 19th century operetta, The Mikado? The simple truth is that for all of the Mikado's hilarity, beauty, and brilliance in this day and age, we at Intermountain Opera could not, in good conscience, present it the way it was originally presented. It misrepresents traditional Japanese culture with offensive character names. The opera's appropriation of Japanese music is another serious distortion of East Asia. Add to that centuries of white performers portraying false and harmful stereotypes in yellow face. And we at Intermountain Opera all agree that the original Mikado is too problematic to present on today's opera stage. In addition, adaptation is a well-established tradition in the world of theater and opera. Shakespeare's plays have been adapted many times over. Think of West Side Story, adapted from Romeo and Juliet, or our own recent production of Kiss Me Kate, adapted from The Taming of the Shrew. The opera Carmen has been adapted into a musical, Carmen Jones, and on and on and on. So it was no great sacrilege when our own Sarah Allen, who you will hear from tonight, had the brilliant idea of embracing the original Mikado's satirical origins, making fun of 19th century Victorian culture, and creating a new satire by making fun of Bozeman today. The result is the Montana Mikado, which runs at, at the Ellen Theater from February 4th through 6th, and next weekend from the 11th through the 13th. Bozeman's own Soren Kissel has written a new and absolutely hilarious libretto with the same music from Sullivan's original score. This is a comic masterpiece and theatrical experience unlike any that Bozeman has ever seen or heard. And I encourage all of you, as soon as this webinar is over, to go immediately online to intermountainopera.org and get tickets if you haven't already. But we at IOB didn't want to just ignore the problematic history of the original Mikado. Rather, we wanted to use this production as an opportunity to enrich our community with educational opportunities addressing representation in opera. Intermountain Opera will also host pre-performance lectures at the Ellen Theater one hour before each performance with writer and director Soren Kissel to learn more about how he created this new and hilarious work. And we will also host post-show talkbacks with members of the cast so you can ask your questions after the show. But tonight, finally, I'm thrilled to introduce our host for tonight's webinar and panel, Sarah Allen has crafted this series, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Mikado, to help us all appreciate the biases, stereotypes, and discrimination that are a part of the original Mikado and that are sadly still a part of our society today. Sarah is an assistant professor in the Department of Family, Life, and Human Development at Southern Utah University. Over the past 20 years, her research and teaching have centered on diversity training, along with individual, family, and community health and well-being. She's on the board of numerous arts organizations, including Intermountain Opera Bozeman, and has a passion for the arts and its capacity to positively transform individuals and institutions. Sarah will be speaking with members of Asia, Montana State University's Asian Student Interracial Alliance tonight. And now I'd like to introduce the president of Asia, Olivia. Olivia will kick off our, kick off our panel discussion tonight. So Olivia, take it away. Thank you, Susan. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Olivia. As Susan mentioned, I am the current president of the Asian Student Interracial Association, also known as Asia. Um, we are a very newly formed association at MSU um, that is open to anyone, anytime, whether you are her your heritage or non-heritage, graduate or undergraduate, faculty or staff, or even a community member. Um, so if you haven't gotten the chance yet, uh, before if you guys, the very first slide of um, the panel, there's a QR code if you'd like to learn more about our Lunar New Year event series that we're hosting this entire week um, to celebrate Lunar New Year, the Year of the Tiger. Um, so yeah, feel free to check our webpage. We're also very active on our Instagram if you guys would like to stay connected with what we're doing in Bozeman and on campus. Um, our association is the first Pan-Asian Association at MSU since February of 2021. Um, we are absolutely overwhelmed with gratitude by the support we received both on campus and in the Bozeman community. 
So before beginning, I first wanted to sincerely thank um, the Intermountain Opera Bozeman for inviting Asia to participate in a discussion surrounding the Mikado and uplifting voices of AAPI through this webinar series. The COVID-19 pandemic through xenophobic and anti-AAPI hate sentiment um, ignited the rise of AAPI racism across the nation. However, both racially motivated events and government oppression of AAPI communities have a very, very long history in the United States. Establishing spaces such as this webinar series is what is crucially needed to increase the awareness of the historic and present discrimination of Asian Americans across the nation and within our own community. Thank you all again for participating tonight. And now I would like to invite the rest of the panelists to introduce themselves before we all get started. And Sierra, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sierra. I am a first year uh, mental health counseling graduate student at MSU. I am also the graduate teaching assistant at the Diversity and Inclusion Student Commons on campus. Um, I am super passionate about um, combining my interests of social justice, um, my interest in mental health and pursuing research and education around mental health topics, um, specifically that, um, that specifically um, impact the AAPI community. Um, I'm excited to be here and um, have this conversation with everyone. I'll just go ahead. <laughs> um, hi folks, my name is Frances. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. Uh, I work as a public health professional here in Bozeman uh, for a company called JG Research and Evaluation. Uh, so I've been uh, working in public health. Um, I did my graduate degree out in New York City and uh, I've, been wor I've worked on numerous uh, health projects with uh, tribal health across the state. I've done statewide health surveillance surveys uh, needs assessments with Montana and other states. Um, I have a huge passion for racial and health equity. Uh, I founded a local nonprofit that is uh, dedicated to BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, or people of color in the outdoors. Since Bozeman is a very heavily outdoorsy community, I wanted to create a nice uh, affinity space for uh, BIPOC community members. Um, so. I am really grateful to be a part of this panel tonight. So thank you for inviting me. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm an undergrad at MSU. Um, I'm studying biology and chemical engineering, and I run a, another like small community organization in Bozeman called Montana Reproductive Freedom, where we do a lot like relating to like, especially student, like uh, student, reproductive health, um, particularly like those students at like MSU. Um, and then I also work for the UN as a translator. Uh, and I'm also super excited to be here and talk to like all of you tonight. Oh, and I'm Alex, my pronouns are she, her. Sorry, I mean to unmute myself. Thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. Um, we have a fantastic panel and I'm really looking forward to our conversation tonight. Um, just as a general sort of roadmap, we're gonna be here. Um, we've, we've built in more time, so we have a lot more time to chat and explore your questions. So we, the panel will end at 7.30 and we're gonna sort of try and find a sweet spot between providing some educational content and discussion and questions from all of you on the webinar. So thank you for joining us. Um, after we sort of talk briefly about how to create a brave space, we're going to explore three core questions. Who is an ally? Why are allies important? and some of the do's and don'ts of allyship, just to sort of get us rolling and I'll prevent, present just a little content and really wanna hear mostly from our panelists tonight. At any point, if you have questions, you can just type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll try and get to them as we go or for sure at the end. So we really welcome and encourage your participation in this webinar together. 
Um, before I start, I wanted to just spend a moment just to recognize and honor all of those who have suffered and are lost their lives in the recent uptick in anti-Asian American hate that Olivia was referring to, and also honor all of those who have come before allyship. There's a very long, long history of people who have worked for social justice and want to honor all of those who have come before and paved the way to have this continued conversation. And then just extend gratitude for all the scholars who inform sort of my perspective on this. This is just, it's not exhaustive, but it is um, a representation of many of the African American, Asian American and indigenous scholars who have um, shared their work on allyship and how to be an ally. Um, that I'll be sharing with you tonight. And then lastly, just um, want to recognize all of our positionalities. We come to this conversation from multiple, multiple sort of intersecting social identities, and some of those are advantaged and some of those are disadvantaged. And allyship really is a sign of privilege in many cases. And so I think the thing that's nice about that is we all need allies and we all can be allies for various groups and people depending on where we are. So it's it's a really um, nice way to situate ourselves in what it means to be an ally and, and, and um, how we can better be allies. So in regards to creating a brave space, I'm so thankful that our, our panelists are willing to share their, their stories and experiences with us. I really just wanna encourage everyone on the call to work together to create a brave learning and growth space where we're gracious and intentional. Our best thinking and questions and um, listening with open hearts and minds. And um, if you sort of hit any kind of roadblocks, just keeping your egos and judgments and assumptions in check, be curious about those. Gentle with ourselves and others. Um, it's possible we might make some mistakes tonight. We're all here to learn. And then just, again, allyship really in the final analysis has a lot to do with action and skills. And so trying to commit to at least testing out one new skill or thing that you learned tonight as you listened to the panelists. So we're gonna start with a, just a very general question. I'll provide just a little bit of content and then we really want to hear from our panelists. When you think about who is an ally, sort of if we just look at the word, it's a verb and it means to enter into an alliance or join or unite. And if we look at a more sort of like a textbook sort of definition, it's any person who supports, empowers or stands up for another person or group or people or someone who disrupts oppressive spaces by educating others on the realities and histories of marginalized people. Um, obviously there's lots of other ways to di disrupt oppressive spaces, but um, really it's sort of an invitation to the margins. And this is a lovely sort of visualization of if we all actually move to the margins and stood with people who are often marginalized in, in society, those margins would get erased. And um, there's this idea that you need to have, you know, like 10 PhDs before you can, you know, feel like you're an expert and know enough uh, as to how to do this work. But we just really need to show up, um, even when we feel like we're not experts, um, and really sort of protect um, the vulnerable people in our society, because um, we're the ones we've been waiting for. Um, so I'm going to just end there and just check in with our panelists. Um, how would you answer that question? You know, who is an ally? What does it mean to be an ally? I guess I can go. It's kind of hard to tell who's going to talk on, <laughs> on a webinar. Um, but yeah, I guess I can kind of um, go first, just starting with like personal experiences of my own. Um, I think like for me, where I would love, love to see allyship first come is I think taking the pressure off of minority communities, um, especially in situations like, for example, microaggressive situations that I know the webinar had a previous um, series or a previous session about talking about microaggression. Um, because for example, in those situations where you're in a group of friends and you know, you're just like kicking back, just you know, having a casual moment, and then someone says like a comment that can either sound, it sounds a little bit off, especially for the person at which it's directed to, especially if it's a racial microaggression. Um, it's those moments where you, the person who just got that comment, you don't really know what to do, what to say. Um, and so being a good ally in that type of example would be speaking up for that situation and calling it out. Um, and I think just 
like for if you guys are familiar with the stop aapi hate organization there's some tips that and i know sierra wants to talk more about the bystander intervention but they give some tips if you're ever witnessing um, something like that happen um, it's of course you want to have safety first you stay calm but importantly you speak out um, and i think in those situations it just it's very necessary to feel supported and when nobody does comment it kind of sounds it feels like nobody cares and so being a good ally is showing putting your putting that input you're putting the initiative to stand up for what you see and what is wrong um but yeah i guess that's kind of just like an example of what an ally would look like in my own life and times that i wish there you know were um but yeah sierra francis and alex i don't know if you guys had any other input on that yeah i would say that even people i've experienced like in montana um who don't mean necessarily to always be even if they do like accidentally do some say something that's insensitive or um accidentally be like microaggressive i think the people who are just willing to like learn and listen as to why what they're doing is insensitive or why it might be upsetting like i think we all have do things and don't always like say the right thing or do the right thing even though we wish we would but i think that just being willing to accept that we're imperfect and being willing to grow and learn from those situations is what like i think allyship really is um yeah i also think um on top of that of being okay with being uncomfortable and going out of your comfort zone when it comes to using your voice. Um, I've witnessed or experienced, you know, classmates or people I've known of saying like, well, I'm white, like I'm in no place to say anything or stand up. I'm, I'm a white person. I don't, I, sh I don't like, I don't have a say or whatever. And I think that is not a good excuse. Um, I think that um, minorities need people to be uncomfortable, whatever that looks like, and use their voice and use their privilege, and which we're going to talk about um, later on today. Um, but yes, I, I think silence is um, probably the most harmful thing. Um, and I don't think people realize that, um, but it is. Um, so just being able to, yeah, call people out and we're going to talk more about that, but that's more of like my initial thoughts. Sorry, my internet's been, been a little bit funky, so um, I definitely agree with what everyone's said so far. Uh, I think being uncomfortable is so key to, to learning how to be an ally. I think the process of being an ally and um, it's, it's a process. It's, you know, it's not, and it's not perfect. It's not going to be this one shot road that, you know, you got it all right. off of oh, <laughs> um, it's taking the pressure off of um, the individual because in those situations like if that happens like I don't want to sit there and have to explain why that hurt I don't want to have to sit there and explain why my thought process was you know going there um, and I think if people were to take the initiative to do their own learning it would it would make those awkward moments go away when somebody who's not identifying in that situation that didn't see that microaggression happen or see that racist act happen, instead of them saying, well, did it really happen? They would know, oh, it did happen and they would know how to address it and they would know how to have that conversation and start that dialogue with that person. Yeah, and I think, I mean, going off of Olivia, like the probably one of the most harmful things, especially maybe it's something, yeah, that has been consistent in my life of what I face is, invalidation of what I've experienced or things that people have said and in the time like even still like I was younger I didn't I didn't have a lot of like self-awareness identity development at the time so I would laugh it off and it was nothing but now looking back and you know having these conversations with these people um from those days of like hey like that was actually harmful like I didn't 
realized I didn't stand up for myself, but like, and just like the invalidation of experiences is very hard. Um, Yeah, and you know, that actually really re leads really nicely into this next question as to why allies are important. And um, I'm not going to pull up this slide, but some of the ideas are that they can use their position of power and privilege to dismantle stereotypes, biases, patterns of justice, but also kind of more um, to your point, Sierra, they can interrupt those potentially really hurtful um, interactions. They can be an advocate and, and, and a catalyst for social change. And I'd like to hear what um, anyone, I guess, on the panel, um, when you think of why allies are important, how would you respond? How would you respond to that? So I think about um, some of my experience in activism and community organization here in Bozeman, it's kind of where I started um, because I felt really, really isolated. And that's kind of when I found my voice. Um, and uh, I guess, sorry, I, I'm like totally blanking on what the question was. Can you repeat that? Um, I mean, we can go wherever you want, but I was like, why are allies important? Why do we need allies? Oh. You know? Yeah. So, you know, I, I thought a lot about um, my experiences in uh, community organizing. I did a lot of um, did a lot of conversations with conservation organizations that were pr predominantly white. Um, and, you know, no matter what I said, no matter how nicely I said it, um, no matter how much I policed my own tone to come off as more palatable, people still didn't listen. And I think that's kind of where allyship is really necessary in these moments of, you know, people aren't going to listen to me. I, what I've noticed is that people in these positions of power aren't going to listen to me, no matter how I say it, no matter how nice I am. And I think at that point, allies who, you know, have kind of a greater set, set of privileges are able to kind of use their voice to say, you know, to be able to I don't know, bring, bring us to the table in a way that, you know, we can't ourselves. Um, so I, I think a lot about that. Um, I think about safety being um, like first and foremost um, for me, um, knowing that especially living in a predominantly white community that I do have people who have my safety, I mean, we're all community, we should be looking out for everyone, but um, especially in recent times during COVID with the rise in AAPI hate, um, just like, it's just knowing that people do have my back and people do have my safety at, um, as a priority and just keeping an eye out about for that. Um, because yeah, like reality is, yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> There's fear of driving <laughs> by myself out of you know, to different parts of, of Montana and walking. And um, it's just, yeah, um, I'm from the DC, Maryland area, very diverse area. And I fortunately never really felt that until um, I think more recent, the past couple of years and, as, and especially here in Montana. Um, so I think safety um, is the biggest thing. Yeah, safety is so key. And, you know, I'm kind of to, um, you kind of mentioned something about like even just driving around Montana. So when I was working on the various reservations across the state, uh, there was a time, so I, I was driving by myself. Um, and this was kind of before I figured out like which roads I could take in order to not be followed, which is exactly what happened one time when I almost uh, ran out of gas in sort of a more rural part. Um, I got followed by two men in a truck. And I was like, I just noped on out of there. I was like, what What could I have done? You know, like there was nothing for me to do. And I think the space that I was in, unfortunately, just wasn't safe for me. And we have to think about that. And even here, you know, I've been told to get out of, the, go back to my country. Like this has happened. 
these things have happened here. And I think what people, especially in Bozeman, love to talk about is that, oh, well, that's not the Montana I know. And I'm like, well, the Montana I know has put me in danger, you know? And so, it, yeah, it's kind of, um, our safety is at risk just by existing, unfortunately. And that's kind of a harsh reality for us, especially when we've seen like, you know, the rise in hate crimes against Asian, uh, Asian Americans. It's, it's really, you know, we need that, we need, we need your help to stay safe. Yeah, I definitely say safety is a really, really big factor of it because just thinking about my own experiences, in those moments when things happen, it's like that flight or fight response. And like, I always, every time I go back to my friends and be like, oh, can you believe this happened? I should have said this, I should have said that. In those moments, my responses will always and always be flight. And I've never had a moment where I actually stood my ground and actually fought back because of I'm, I'm concerned about my safety. And in those situations that I'm with a group of people, um, those are the times that that would be really, really helpful in those situations to take, again, the pressure off and offer that protection and use their privilege to be able to speak up and say something where I don't have to be worried about my safety anymore because I know that I'm being supported. I know that I have a, a group that is gonna be there to you know, help combat anything that were to happen. Um, but yeah, safety definitely, it definitely is a very big aspect of it. Alex, anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, I feel like luckily I, I haven't felt a lot of those feelings. Like I'm from Montana and I, I've grown up in this very heavily white um, environment, but I think that the biggest thing that is also important is I think colorism and being like white passing. I, I definitely feel like I have an Asian last name and I definitely feel that in a lot of situations, I personally have experienced very little discrimination. And then even like slight things, like when I mentioned my last name, like the tone suddenly will change and the situation is slightly different. And I definitely feel privileged because I'm white passing that I haven't experienced a lot of the things that you guys are talking about. But even then, like I, I do feel like there is a sliding scale of that. And I think that when we accept the smaller actions on an everyday basis, like it leads up to scary things like Francis was saying, um, that like things people like following you home. So I think that even though like small things are easy to brush off, they do have like end up having larger impact that could affect safety, especially when you look at like the amount of like hate crimes that have increased in like current days. Yeah, I was looking at a statistic um, earlier and it was, um, I wrote it down somewhere just because I knew I was going to forget. But um, so San Francisco Police uh, Department had stated that there was a 567% increase in hate crimes against AAPI since in 2021. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. That's huge. That's a giant, in, that's 567%. That is, in, that's just wild. Yeah, and maybe that, I mean, if you're comfortable, maybe we should unpack that a little bit more in regards to safety. You mentioned, like, might not feel safe driving um, on certain roads, or I might not feel safe walking at night. I might not feel safe in a, in a certain location. Um, are there other nuances to that, like entering classrooms, entering restaurants, like, um, just feeling safe in, you know, as a larger kind of um, you know, experience. Yeah, touching, touching on what you just um, said, Sarah, and also kind of going back to what Alex was talking about, um, the biracial identity is, I think, something that comes into play here because like in my own experiences, like all my experiences I'm talking about, because I'm racially ambiguous, all of my experiences are when I'm talking about when I embrace my culture rather than what people assume based off my physical characteristics. And so um, I just lost my train of thought, but with the biracial identity, um, I think the situations in which, I totally forgot my train of thought there, I'm sorry, um, but yeah, I'm sorry, what was the question again? I'm full, I did the same as Francis, I was like on a track and then. 
<laughs> we were talking about safety and I think I think you were getting to the point that you didn't feel safe when you fully embraced your cultural identity but mm -hmm. if you could pass as white because you're biracial then then that was a different uh, a thing I'm not sure if that's where you're headed yeah. but yeah so um where I was headed with that is like for example like my my car um has a lot of I have the Philippine flag on my car and I also have a sticker that says celebrate Asian culture um and so I've Every like I'm I'm not kidding. Every single time I drive in Bozeman, I have had situations where, and I drive very very safely, and I drive, and I'm I'm proud of how I drive, but I've had multiple occurrences where people will, and whether in their big trucks or whatever, come by and just flip me off, or they'll come by and they'll you know make a face at me. They'll drive so close up to my car that I'm afraid they're going to hit me, and so I have to go to the other the right side of the the next lane. And so in those times, I'm always thinking I'm like. Well, like the way I see myself, like people, I don't know, I will never know how people see me, but then I always wonder, I'm like, is it because of the stickers on my car? Is it because I have a California license plate, which it could be? Um, and it's like all those small little things, which I'm sure we'll probably talk about later, intersectionality, um, which comes up to play, comes in play here. But yeah, it's just like those situations, um, it makes it really, really difficult to unpack. And so for me, like I'm always scared when I go out and drive around town um, because it just, I guess like a, a very recent experience um, that was really, it was really hard for me um, was I recently got pulled over for the first time in my entire life um, here in Bozeman. And I remember there were about three cops that came out of the car to address, to address me. Um, and I was very stunned by that. And I don't know if it could be a safety issue or something. Um, but the reason, I won't go into detail why they pulled me over, but it wasn't for speeding or anything. But the reason why they pulled me over, I was very stunned by the fact that they, I guess, gave me a ticket for it. Because um, when they first initially pulled me over, I didn't know what was the reason. Um, and then before they finally came to my window, I saw them looking at the back of my car for a very, very long time. Um, and I, and even now, I don't know, was it my plates or was it my flag or was it, the, you know, like, I will never know. Um, and even talking with people about the situation, they were like, oh, I'm surprised they didn't just give you a warning for that. And I was like, cool. So I, I don't know. It's like little situations like that. And then even me driving down the street, like, do I feel safe anymore? Like, I don't, I honestly don't. <laughs> and I, I had a similar like experience happen to me not with the police, but just where like, I've been like wondering, I think like being biracial, I was out with friends and a guy approached me and like, we were all just talking and it didn't seem, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. One of my friends made a joke, like I'm half Asian, right? And my family lives in Asia. Um, and one of my friends made a joke like, oh, Alex, Alex is good at cooking ramen or something because her family lives in Japan. And um, one of the men was like, wow, I'm so surprised. You don't look very Asian. And the person was obviously quite drunk. But he went up to my face and he pulled my eyes up, like far, like slanted and was saying like, now you look more Asian. And it's, I think it's also difficult because we're like being female or identifying as female. I think what is like the relationship in the intersectionality of this discrimination occurring because of our my racial identity and also because of my gender because I do feel like even if I was an Asian man I feel like I still would I don't think that would have necessarily happened in that situation so like I think that it's really difficult I think especially with like the fetishization and sexualization of being female that also really scares me I think especially when it comes to like dating scene or just in general like older people I constantly feel like I, I feel sexualized because of my race. And, and that also plays into, I think, safety in a different way. Like I can't name the amount of times that like it's all like that whenever someone says something, it, it happens to be about like my race. And it, it makes me really uncomfortable. And I think like you're saying, like it's difficult to like separate these different like intersecting issues and actually just like figure out what's what's what and like why um, you're like certain things are happening. Yeah, and I kind of um, want to go off of um, Alex with that of, yes, the fetishization, fetish, I don't know how to say that word, fetishization <laughs> and um, exoticism and the sexualization of Asian women. And yeah, just thinking about 
oh, you're, you're going to ask me, what am I? The question, what are you before my name? Like yeah. the what, like that word, what implies I'm an object. It, it, it's objectifying me. And I've got that in my entire life. And I really was until recently like, oh shit, that, that's wrong. Like that's, that's, <laughs> that's not a good liner to open up a conversation to get to know me and thinking about more of like the bigger picture of that, of like what the actual issue is, like who cares? Like why, why do I have to feel like I'm like othered in a way or, oh, you, where are you really from? Or you don't seem Asian. You're, oh, like, what are you? Oh, you're Chinese. You don't seem Asian or you don't look Asian. I thought you were this or that or whatever. Like I've gotten that my entire life and it's just, it's old. And I think these micro, these small microaggressions that invalidate our Asian identity experience, like so harmful. And I think this is such an important part. And thank, thank you, Alex, for bringing that up of like, part of this conversation of bringing forth of like these concerns, these issues that are happening like literally every day, Bozeman, everywhere that maybe people don't, aren't aware of. Um, and so in order to be a good ally, like just to have awareness of these things that we face um, and validate them. Yeah. Yeah, this is- I think um, outrage, I think is important. I, I like, I definitely, I was talking to my friend about this, like, obviously, like, I'm not African American, and I don't understand that experience. I grew up in Montana. Um, but I do have to say that, like, when after the Atlanta shootings happened, like, I was really disappointed that there wasn't, like, a large, like, outrage about, like, the danger, and just, like, the experience that, like, a lot of AAPI people have, and, like, like, hate crimes that happen. And I feel like at the same time, I know that, like, there have been times with my friends and people around me where something really disturbing will happen. And I will always wonder, like, if my friend was a, of a different, like, oppressed group, would, like, would their response be different? And sadly, like, I, I often times, I say, like, I do feel like because of, like, things like the model minority myth and issues like that, that, like, Asian American issues in particular are not taken with the same severity. Like, I know I was talking to my dad who said that he'd been called, like, racial slurs oftentimes and nothing really happened even though he reported it um and his best friend was African American saying that like yeah if someone said like the n-word like everyone would be extremely upset up in arms like why just because we have a different minority background should like the, the hate and the experience that we feel be any different and I think that it all does play into a similar similar issues I think especially in Montana like and with increases in like hate crimes I think that we need to like be outraged about like this the acts of violence and about the racism that's occurring and not excuse it. Yeah, I think what's frustrating um, to kind of go back to the Atlanta spa shooting is that no one marched for us. Yeah, exactly. That's like it was really disappointed because like even in other examples, when small like not like but like when some things happen like there's a large outrage like people are up in arms like there's protests and there's no nothing like and then like a week later you didn't really hear about it anymore yeah I think that really goes to show sort of the performative allyship that happens a lot in Bozeman is that people will pick the most like pressing thing or you know what they see is like this is going to make me seem like a great ally and not actually include you know all of us as you know minorities here like we make up in in montana we make up so aapi make up one percent of this population um if i look at into gallatin county uh that's a little bit higher i think probably because of the university but that's 1.7 percent and the white population in gallatin county as of 2019 is 94.7 percent so yeah, it's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty stark, you know, and I, to kind of go back to that performative allyship, like, I feel like that's so, you know, I, I think a lot of people like to think that Bozeman is quite liberal and is quite safe. Um, I was called racial slurs outside of the Crystal Bar once um, and people were, you know, they kind of brushed it off like it wasn't a big deal. And I was like, okay, well, that sucks for me, <laughs> I guess. Like, I don't, what, you know, what, I, 
there was nothing I can really do or say. Like, it felt like we, yeah, because because of this model minority myth, we're not particularly seen as like vulnerable. And that's just not true. You know, with the Atlanta spa shootings, that was a targeted attack on Asian women, you know? And I think that's really, it kind of brought um, into, you know, focus that like, so for example, like uh, stop Asian, stop AAPI hate. Um, I think someone had written, um, so there was an increase of 55.7% in 2021 of reported hate crimes. And I think when we talk about intersectionality, all, up to 70% of those attacks were towards Asian women. So I think that's kind of something that we need to really talk about. And I, I'm really grateful to be a part of this panel with really amazing Asian women, because you know I think the misogyny and the stereotypes that we face are so unique too. Um, and that's not to say that Asian men don't deal with these things too. I think Asian men tend to be desexualized and kind of seen as robotic or whatever it might be. Um, but I do think that we need to really think about the intersectionality of uh, race and gender here because we are particularly vulnerable to violence. Um, and these like stereotypes that we've been experiencing are based in history. So prior to the Chinese Exclusion Act, there was the Page Act of eight of 1875. And if you don't know what that is, it's essentially, so before the Chinese Exclusion Act, this prevented Chinese women from Im immigrating to the U.S. because there was this, un there was this uh, thought that Asian women would be immigrating here to do sex work. So this is a historical context that I don't think people really think about and how that's actually shaped the way that people view us and how we face discrimination and oppression now. Um, Historical context is so important. Like we can't say that we've moved forward from this when we're constantly seen as foreigners, we're constantly seen as objects of someone's gaze. And I think that's really, I don't know, it's like, it's, a, it's intermedia too, you know, like apocalypse now, things like that. Like, it's just so, uh, it's just so exhausting <laughs> to, to, you know, there's just a lot, there's a lot there. <laughs> Yeah, and I think there really is something to say about, like, part of the allyship is educating yourself on the history of Asian Asian American communities in the history of um, the U.S. And yes, not invalidating and not ignoring what actually happened. Our ancestors are <laughs> like the history of this country that has really contributed to the systemic racism that our our country is grounded in and it cannot be ignored like just because yes like we can look forward and you know fight fight the fight no like there's st still needs to be acknowledgement of the past and I'm not saying like dwell on the past but there needs to be education and just like awareness around what did happen um yeah, and I think definitely, like, as Francis was saying, the historical historical context is so important because I think in part of being an ally is taking the camera off of, like, just, just focusing on your personal, like, your personal biography, thinking about the historical context of your own identity, how, where you are today, what, you know, like, the social factors and forces that, like, influenced you or brought you forward to where you are today, your personal, social context, all of those are so important. I think as we're talking more and more about intersectionality, it might be kind of a good time to kind of describe what is intersectionality to begin with. Um, and intersectionality, I think a lot of times people always approach it in the sense that it's, like, an additive thing. So, like, a lot of times people are talking about, oh, like, you're Asian, you're woman, you're, um, he you're not hetero, or you're um, part of the LGBTQ plus community. And so like you have all those different identities, but the thing is, is that they're not just, you're not adding them, they all intersect. And the best way, I believe it was um, author Collins, I can't remember her first name, but the way she described it is intersectionality is like if you're at a traffic circle and you have all these different cars coming from all over the place. Intersectionality is where they all meet and where they all collide. You can't talk about racism. If you're talking about an Asian American woman experiencing racism, you can't talk about racism, just racism. You have to talk about the fact that she's a woman, the fact that she's Asian, the fact that 
you know, whatever other identity might be applying, you have to talk about all of them to understand what the full picture is going on and what, what was the incident, what happened. Um, and so that's kind of the, I guess, like the best way that I kind of talk about intersectionality. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you guys have any other input in describing it. No, I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just really taking into account the different components of your identity, of what makes you you, your history, your family, um, socioeconomic status, like it all inter interacts and intersects. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that could be a really important component of being an ally is understanding when and where and why and how you need to be an ally. Um, and I really liked, I think, um, I'm noticing the conversation shifting a little bit to like um, some do's, like how to be a good ally. I know, uh, Sierra, you're like, yeah, let's connect the past to the present. Let's learn about the history. Let's, um, you know, don't expect, especially if you're in the dominant group to be taught, like do your own homework, do some research mm -hmm. and learn about this. Are there other sort of do's? If we go to like some do's and don'ts of allyship, what are some other um, things that we should be thinking about um, that will help us be better allies? I think um, <laughs> recently I kind of had like an epiphany that like our friends are an important reflection upon ourselves and just the people that we surround ourselves with. And I think that the biggest thing is holding people accountable for what they say and not like letting like I, I mean everyone is always like oh I have like a racist uncle or he's just a little bit um he's just a little bit you know out there right but I think that like the more we make excuses for people who do things like I think it does reflect upon ourselves and I think that like really holding people accountable for what they are saying like those around us because like by spending time with people and by not standing up and not trying to educate even those around us that we might make them uncomfortable, I think that we are not really helping the problem. And I think that when it's not, you're not moving forward, if you're just standing still, like you are like kind of part of the issue that's happening. And I think I especially see it with like men and like um, male groups. And I think just like that, oh, you know, that's just something that we brush off and we act as if, as if it's not an issue. Like, you, but I, I think especially in Montana with the culture, but I think that we are all like responsible for the community that we want to create. And I think like, especially to those that, that are like, oh, I'm apolitical, I, I don't have a take, like I'm white, like I'm, I'm straight, I'm cis. I think that like, just because you are those things, like there's definitely people that you know that you've actually um, made uncomfortable by like the people that you surround yourself with, even if you do want to be an ally. So again, I just think that like, honestly, really feeling like that you are willing to be uncomfortable especially to those around you who are, who, who may, might be insensitive and might be a little bit racist to just be better in the future. I think that's honestly the, one of the only things we can do to move forward. Yeah, I feel like um, what I like to say to some of my friends is that accountability is my love language. If I don't care about you, I'm, I'm not gonna, there's no reason for me to bring up like that you said something that hurt me, you know? Um, and so when people do call you out, it's because they care. Because otherwise, why would we go through this like trauma to like bring up these things? Uh, we want, you know, when we know better, we do, we do better, or we should do better, right? Um, and so, yeah, that was just a little thought that I had as Alex was talking. Yeah, and I think if you're somebody in that situation where you are being held accountable, it's so important to have open ears in those situations because even if it might come across of like, whoa, they're attacking me, you have to understand there's like that trauma there and there's that situation like even trying to talk about it is very painful and very, it's very frightening because you never know how the person's going to react. So I think in those times, it's just being open ears um, because again, as we, I think Francis was saying in the very beginning, no one's perfect. We're all learning. Um, and so I think a lot of times people are afraid, even being an ally, people are afraid to like speak up or say something because they're like, oh, it's like, I don't know enough to have an opinion. I don't know enough to like say something. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I don't have the right language or, you know, but I'd the thing is, we're, try. yeah, like you might mm -hmm. as well, you might as well try and like show that you are supporting that person instead of leaving them in the corner where they feel like nobody, nobody cares. Um, yeah. And so 
I think it's just, it's bravery, bravery on an ally's part and initiative and also just being attentive and open ears. Um, because in the, at the end of the day, if you just say one thing, that's going to mean the world in whatever that, whatever situation it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's rooted in empathy. That's just rooted in your way of being. And like, if you're a good person, if you, you know, you are working on raising your own self-awareness and like into yourself, like that helps form and like form that empathy for others as well. Um, so I think, yeah, like to support others, support, to be an ally is just being a good person, being empathetic and like having that like core value of like, I mean, yes, there are wrong things to say, like good, like good and bad things to say, but like, it does come down to just like you being a good person and sticking up for other people. Like it doesn't have to be. I know easier said than done like it doesn't have to be complicated but like yes like it just comes down to being a good person and caring about others yeah I think that empathy is just I think we actually have a hard time as a society with empathy and I think we're seeing this a lot with you know how the last few years have been um that we're you know this isn't like a political issue this isn't something that should be seen as like related to politics or whatever. This is about humanity. <laughs> and I know that sounds so corny to say, but it's true. And I, you know, what we're doing is we're just trying, we're just trying to fight to, to be seen as human because we're not seen as that. And, you know, if, if someone does, if, if a person, like a BIPOC person does say, hey, what you said really hurt me, like that took a lot of vulnerability. And that means to be vulnerable is to trust you. So I think you should take that as a badge of honor and be like, okay, like, let me look inward, as Sierra said, and let me think about, you know, that harm that was caused. How can I do better next time? Mm -hmm. It's okay to make mistakes. I think people get afraid about the fact that, oh, I don't want to offend, I don't want to just flat out offend someone. It's like, you know, if you have a relationship with this person, like friendship, whatever it might be, like, and you value that friendship, if someone does call you out because yeah, and kind of like what Olivia's saying, it's it's kind of a flight or fight response, right? Like you've been traumatized. Like these things that have been, that happened to us, it's traumatizing. And sometimes it's hard to express that in a way that might, you know, it might come off as like attacking to you, but it's not about you. It's not, it's really not about you. It's, we're not saying, hey, you're just a racist white person. No one is saying that. Like, and I think that's like, I think that's a really harmful, like, um thing that is happening these days is like the automatic like oh well you're just going to call me a racist and it's like no we want we just want you to like we just want you to do better because you hurt me and what that comes down to is that human empathy i think you know kind of what everyone's been saying yeah and i, I think something that i've been noticing as well um in our community is yeah like the pol politicization of of um racism and maybe higher up institutions not making statements or not doing anything because it's making a political statement and yeah i i mean we're individuals i'm just thinking like yeah how can you be an ally on a greater level i'm still trying to figure that out but um i think it comes down to yeah how can you convince these higher up people just be humanistic, I guess, when it comes to making decisions and really looking out for community members who are being impacted, their safety is being severely impacted. That's what should matter, not about political statements and what's political. Like that's what makes me so frustrated is like, this is our lives, like these are our lives, these are experiences, they're completely valid, why don't people care? Why aren't people making statements that they support us? And it's just really frustrating. Um, yeah, you can't make people do things. I mean, there's always like other intentions, other alternative motives, but it's just the silence, going back to silence, like yeah. silence is so harmful. 
Yeah. And I, I just like, I'm sitting here as we're talking about how I do not know when the shift or when, or maybe it's always been, but the idea that standing up against racism, when was that ever a political thing or why is it a political thing? And I'm just thinking, and I'm like, is it because all these institutions that are, whether if they're denying, like, you know, releasing a statement or whether they're denying about even talking about it, is it because everything is rooted in, the, in white supremacist ideologies or is it rooted in, you know, if it's just that wanting to be remain gentle or don't want to talk about where you were the bad guys. And it's like, we're not calling you the bad guys. And we're not saying that all white people are bad or whatever. It's more of just using those platforms to bring attention and bring awareness to what's going on. And so I don't know if that's the reason why things, why it has to remain political. Um, and it shouldn't be political because it's not, it's literally just a humanity issue. Um, and again, I guess that, that does start with empathy and if people aren't being empathetic and I think it's like, it's not wanting and it, and I understand like in trying to like talk about it, about how it affects you. Like if you're somebody that's non-identifying, um, like not a part of the group that is experiencing discrimination, it takes a lot. And again, like vulnerability to bring it back to you and be like, look about look in yourself and how your how social factors have brought you to where you are um and it's and it can make you feel vulnerable to kind of like do that inter like that personal reflection of yourself um but i mean it's again being uncomfortable and it's going to be in every situation in which you're trying to address racism well yeah these are all such great um ideas any other any other ways um like sort of thinking about the do's of allyship. So I'm trying to think of maybe if you have suggestions for community members, if they want to increase their knowledge or skills or awareness, um, learn how to interrupt things. Like what are, what are some things that you would suggest that they could do to um, be better allies? Yeah, I'm gonna put in a little plug here um, for Hollaback, which is um, bystander intervention um, trainings. They're all free. They're online. Um, they have a great format. Um, I think it was like their one hour trainings and they have like different ones, but um, they have this programming really to help you navigate, like tell, like they're telling you ways so you can um, intervene um, hate-based harassment um, or words or whatever you are witnessing, whether, um, yeah. And so there's like the five Ds, distract, delegate, document, direct, delay. Um, and I won't go into it now, but I highly recommend people um, look into taking those trainings. Um, they do have specific API um, and just other like trainings specific to um, certain minority communities. Um, but I thought they do a really good job with making it easy to understand and meeting people where they're at and really like, allowing you, not saying like, you have to follow every single thing and then you'll be a good ally. This is not a check of the box, like based on like all of this, like this is a commitment to <laughs> being an ally for life and active learning. Um, but this training will give you the tools to, yeah, leave it up to you to choose what, what would I do in this situation? What can I do in this situation? Um, so that's a great start, start. Yeah, and I think just um, like active participation and again, kind of like what Sierra was saying, but I think a lot of the times where you're going to learn the most is those personal experiences you have with API individuals, um, whether they're your friends, whether they're people in the community, business owners, whatever it might be. If you're actively trying to support them, if you're actively trying to hear them out, ask about what, you know, in on an individual case by case basis. Um, I think those again, like empathy starts with your own personal experiences as well. So I think actively trying to have those friendships, have those acquaintances, support those businesses are where it all, it's all going to start um, to really have those, those moments where it relates to you as well, because they're people you care about. Um, and it, it doesn't like, even in general, like it should be, you care about everyone, but I think in those situations, you can get the most one-on-one um, -on -one conversation about ways that you can be best supporting them um, yeah, as an ally. I think uh, showing up is something that everyone can do. 
um, you know, kind of going back to the, I just, I, I just think about like, you know, for example, Gallatin County is predominantly white. There's a 1.7 AAPI population here. Um, don't go searching out for that one Asian person to be friends with, but, you know, if you don't have really much knowledge or, you know, that sort of thing, like show up to some Asia events. Like if you're a student, go, go show up. I'm not a student, I'm not affiliated with MSU in any way, but they have some amazing events that they've done, including like mental health for AAPI. Like, it's just so cool that this organization or this um, student group exists. I, I think it's really awesome. And you can definitely learn something. Um, and yeah, I think even just showing up to this and just kind of thinking about, or, you know, if you learn something, just I, showing up is like so important. Um, it just, it shows that you have our backs. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, so yeah, I think um, showing up, I think also even just like investing in time, um, you really have to invest in the time to uh, want to educate yourself. I've definitely heard so many times from people who are pretty liberal or like progressive or whatever it might be that I just don't have time to read that book or I don't have time for this. Um, and I think that's kind of, I think it's bullshit, honestly. I think we all have time for some of these things. Um, you can listen to a podcast, you know? There's a really great podcast that I love called Feeling Asian Podcast. It's by two comedians. They're both Korean, um, so a little bit limited in terms of, you know, varying perspectives of Asian identity, but they bring in all kinds of guests. And you can learn a lot from that podcast. It's hilarious. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, is really eye-opening. I listened to it a lot after the Atlanta spa shootings because I felt like I didn't have a space here to talk about it. Um, so listening to that podcast was really helpful for me. And I know that people who, they, they have a lot of listeners who aren't Asian and they say it brings a lot of perspectives that they could never even think about because they aren't Asian, you know? So um, really investing in that time, I think is so important. Um, I also think about like Lunar New Year is starting tomorrow. Like, yeah. look up what that means. It, this is yes. not just one, like one ethnic group that celebrates Lunar New Year. This is every, every. Eth <laughs> like, each ethnic group celebrates it differently. Like yeah. I was just reading about Vietnamese Lunar New Year today. Like I did not know a lot about it. So mm -hmm. that is a great step. Like literally when this call ends or this week or this month, like start reading about it. like, what is it? And um, what do people do? And yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And I think also like reaching out. Um, I think that's like a, if you know people in your life who, I mean, like Francis said, you might not, but if you do, um, I think especially times like after the Atlanta shooting, I had some of my closest friends who reach out to me, but I also had a lot of friends who didn't. And I was honestly a bit like, like, I'm sure everyone, if like those situations that happen, like hurt, um, that people you know, I think having those times where you reach out and like not publicly reaching out in ways that are like, you know, again, going back to the performative allyship, but just like, just those like small little like texts, like, hey, I just wanted to check in. Like, do you feel safe? Is there anything I can do? Like, what can I do to support you? Um, just little things like that. And like, I know sometimes like people, some people are a little bit, you know, more timid in like the whole activism thing. If like, you might not be the one, the person that like, is wants to like you know really broadly like you know be in like the marches and things like that but you know it could be those small little things where you you know text your friends hey are you feeling safe are you okay or supporting to like asian owned businesses you know things like like those small things like if like being like in the spotlight and like those types of like events and situations not your thing there's always those other ways that you can be supportive and you know be a great ally um but yeah, and like even this week, like Sierra was mentioning our Lunar New Year event series, all of our events and every single Asia event is always, always, always open to community members. So like even tomorrow, we're having a research event where we're going to have AAPI researchers um, present their research. And then on Thursday, we're having an event where we have four different, um, we're partnering with Jake Jeb's Business School, and they're having four different um, AAPI business owners who are sharing about their experiences creating a business here in Bozeman. And um, and also some samples of their products, which will be really cool and fun. So like just those like small community events um, or listening to a podcast, it doesn't take a lot of your time. And um, 
yeah, I think those are just some small steps that, you know, you can be a better ally in this community, especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I did actually want to add something back to like the performance or not performance, like checking in with your peers of, yes, you can ask, how are you feeling about this? Like, that is great. But also like attached to that, like, just be prepared. Like they may not want to talk about it. They may, mm -hmm. may not respond and <clears throat> that's okay. They are in you know, they are dealing, they may want to deal with their stuff um, or in their own way. Um, but I think that's something to remember too, of um, if you do reach out and they, they don't want to talk about it, that's okay. Yeah. I think that's uh, really important. Cause like I had some people um, reach out to me that I had no sort of relationship with. Um, like they, I was like, a, we were acquaintances, I guess. And they had um, lumped me into a group message with other Asian people that I didn't know. And it felt really, um, it felt really tokenizing. So, you know, if you truly do care, like don't make it into like this show or like, oh, like here are the two Asian people I know here, like you doing okay. And like, if there's no response, I'm just making sure that you're okay. It's like, are you actually trying to make sure I'm okay? Or are you just trying to placate your own guilt? Like, I think that's something that like, you know, there's this balance between like not doing enough and then doing too much. Um, and so like, for me, it's kind of like, I thought a lot about like, um, you know, the question like, where are you really from? Like, where are you from from? Like, how do I ask someone what their heritage is? And I'm like, do you have a relationship with this person? Like, are you just going up? To, like, I had this happen not that long ago where this like woman was like, oh, I'm from New York. Like, I know this is really offensive, but where are you from? And I was like, hi, my name is Francis. Like what, like, you know, and uh, it's like, I understand the curiosity or whatever it might be, but like, look at me as a human before you look at me as like this object of like a guessing game or whatever it might be. Like I talk about my Korean identity all the time with my friends. Like if we have a relationship, like I'm always talking about it. So, you know, just try not to tokenize people. I feel like that's something that's really uh, happens a lot. Um, and that, you know, with a pop with a very small AAPI population here like again don't just like be like oh you're Asian let's be friends like actually just like I don't know like see us as human beings like first and then like you know you'll you might learn something about our heritage and that's great yeah, and so, I think going, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Olivia. Yeah. Uh, going back to the do's and don'ts, um, just yeah. briefly when Francis was talking, I think if you ever have to say something and say, I'm not racist, but, or I don't, I know this might sound racist, but if you just have to say that, it's probably because it's racist, whatever you're saying. So I think, yeah, that's a nice, yeah, a nice little practice would be like, do I have, like, if I'm about to say that, you know, um, and then I guess just, and like if you say it, apologize. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm kind of trying to briefly see the Q&A, um, but I did see someone was asking about the events this week, and so I just kind of wanted to plug in um, our website. It's asiamsu.wordpress.com um, for people who want to see um, more of the events happening this week. But yeah, just wanted to plug that in there really quick. And it's such a fantastic website. It has resources and films, all sorts of other stuff, not just events. It's a really great place actually to start learning, really. If people want to know how can I learn more and become more aware, go to that website. It's a fantastic start. Um, I know we want to open it up to questions from just the people on the call, but before we do that, I just want to make sure um, that we hit the don'ts. I think we've hit some of them like performative allyship. Um, any other things? I just want to make sure you have an opportunity to share maybe some other, other um, don'ts of allyship. I think, yeah, though, I think definitely asking people, where are you really from is definitely not, not one. I think that also, I, I, I feel like in the past, I've tried to share my culture like things like food with my friends and those around me and things that are like oh that's so disgusting or like one of my friends I gave him a, a mochi he literally spit it out and was like that's disgusting it was like the the drool coming out and I was I was a little bit offended my dad had like shipped me this like package of mochi from Japan and it was really expensive shipping and stuff like that and it was just like and this man is just spitting it out of his mouth and I just think that and also I think the thing the other thing is definitely culture 
I, I feel like people, uh, they'll be like, where are you really from? I'm like, I'm half Asian. And they'll be like, oh, I love anime. And it's like, <laughs> maybe when you first meet someone, don't like say things like, oh, I love sushi or I love anime. Shouldn't be like, before, like you said, like Brand said, like before you even know my name, like you ask me where I'm from. And then you're like, oh, I love Death, Death Note or Netflix or whatever. It's just really uncomfortable. And it, it makes, it definitely does feel like tokenized when you're trying, like, I think that I also do like I there I understand people are like trying to relate to me when they say these things, but these are not things that are necessarily even part of my culture. Um, and I think that respecting, especially when I think being Asian American is like a very different type of cultural identity, because oftentimes like we're first, second, third. I'm not even my 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 father isn't even American, but like generation of immigrants, and so there are these like multiple cultures that have to do with your racial identity. And I think that oftentimes people don't really respect that. Um, and I think that other cultures, it's, it's just a different type of, just different different cultural heritage. I think it's a very unique identity being Asian American. I think that people also just don't respect that. I would also definitely say that I think lumping people who are all Asian together, I found, I really do not appreciate. Oftentimes, I remember like a couple of days ago, I said that like I'm part Taiwanese and Japanese and part Korean, and they're like, oh, that's all the same place, right? And like, definitely not all the same place. And I think that just like being, I think it's better to, like there's there's often like the the idea that, you know, it's sometimes better to like um, do things and then apologize after. But I think when it comes to asking people questions about like racial, ethnic, even like other issues, like someone's sexual orientation, I think it's much, much better to proceed with caution and then not have to apologize for being racist afterwards. But what do you guys have? What would you guys have to say for other don'ts? I think kind of going off of what you were just saying, Alex, and also what Francis um, was mentioning earlier, like if you are having those discussions with people, um, like people are already going to talk about or like Asian Americans are going to or AAPI individuals are going to talk about like their culture already because it's something that it's a part of who they are. And so I think like in those times, like I, I think also another thing is recognizing how diverse um, Asian American identities or, you know, Asian identities are to begin with and like taking a step back and not making those assumptions yet. And also like, because for example, someone might be adopted or they're biracial and like you might be assuming that there's like some other ethnicity that they're not, you know? And so I think just waiting for them to share that's like kind of the moment that you can ask like kind of those questions like, oh, really? So like your grandparents, I know you said they immigrated. So tell me more about that. Tell me more about their experiences rather than being like, where are you from? Like, you look interesting. You look exotic. Like what, where, like, where are you from? And then you're like, oh, I'm, I'm from like California. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like, where are you really from? And I'm like, oh, Sacramento. And they're like, no, no, no. You know, like <laughs> your ancestors. And I was like, you know, just like things like that, like just wait for people to like, you know, share that and then maybe ask those questions to learn more about their culture. I think about like the other side of the spectrum of this, right, of colorblindness of like, oh, well, you know, it's the racial ideology that believes the best way to end discrimination is simply just treating all individuals as equals. So like, yes, humans should be equal. However, ignoring and completely dismissing race, skin color, racial disparities in inequalities, inequities, and histories of violence and trauma, like all of those, like that just completely dismissing and just like, oh, I don't see color. I just see people like that is harmful in itself. Yeah. And it's like, that's the other side of the spectrum of like, oh, I don't see it. And so it's like finding, like, I'm still ch actually like trying to figure out, like, there's a lot of nuances to that, right? And like, people are like, well, then what am I supposed to do then? Like, what's the right thing to do? And um, it's just really like, I mean, Olivia said everything perfectly. And, it, but it, that is like colorblindness is something to bring to your awareness that it is a real thing. And people, that is something that people think about. And so I guess it's, yeah, how can I appreciate this person's culture, but not be like, um, what's the word? Like, like I don't know. Someone help me with the word. <laughs> Just not, like, like being like confrontational maybe? about it. Like insensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Not being insensitive about it. And um, yeah, because you can be interested and yeah. want to know, but there's definitely ways you can do it that's sensitive and with that empathy. Yeah, and I really love what Olivia was saying, but if you just 
follow their lead. If they yes. share something about their racial or ethnic background, then it seems like they're willing to explore that. So then maybe ask a question, but if they don't bring it up, you know, talk, find another way to connect about yeah. just, you know, ask yeah. you. also just why, like, I always wonder that when people are like, <coughs> where are you really from? It's like, do you want my social security number as well? It's like, why do you want to know these things? Like, do you also want to know like my middle school, like what sports I played in high school? Like these are all deeply personal questions. And I just met you. Like, why mm -hmm. do you want to know these things? And I feel like oftentimes, like I've experienced some people are saying, I'm just, I just ask them, I just keep asking them why when they ask personal questions and they just look so uncomfortable. And that's how I felt. Like it's the same thing as like you're you see someone on the street and you're like, what's your blood type? It's just why would you ask this question? Like it's really personal, it's really creepy. Um, especially when it comes to like, do you ever, um, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but like, especially with men, like, um, I'll say like, oh, does it, did it, does anyone ever try to speak to you guys in foreign Asian languages, yes. like without even speaking to you? Does it, does it make you deeply uncomfortable as well? I thought that was, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't like, understand what you're saying. Yeah, no, people will sometimes just like say stuff and I'm like, like, I don't, I don't, I don't speak like I'm Korean, like I don't speak that, like I don't speak Japanese, like, you know, or like people just say shit and I'm just like, Ugh. like it's just so uncomfortable. <laughs> it's just very uncomfy. Um, something that I did want to bring up in terms that is kind of relevant to Bozeman in particular is like cultural appropriation, particularly with food. Um, so there was a lot of issues with the uh, cultural appropriation of like Vietnamese culture, of Hawaiian culture and people were saying that, you know, oh, like this Vietnamese food is a good niche to get into, even though I've never like cooked it or I went to Japan once though, so it's cool. Or like someone else saying, oh, I love Hawaiian shirts. I love the chill Hawaiian culture. So I'm gonna create a poke truck. Like, no, stop oh. that. <laughs> oh my God, it's so irritating. It's like, it, I'm not saying that you can't make that kind of food, but when you're saying it blatantly, like, oh, well, I just like the, I just like the shirts, like, oh, I just, I went to Japan once, and so I can make Vietnamese food. I'm like, what are you, what? And I think what's really frustrating is that, like, um, institutions also perpetuate this because, for example, and this is my cat, Mandu, um, like, the Bozeman Daily Chronicle is publishing this shit, you know? Like, they're the ones who are, like, Oh yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a good niche. Let me give you some like press coverage on this. And it's like that's these are these are th this is problematic. Like this is not that's not okay. Like when someone blatantly calls your culture's food like a niche and then they're like, "Oh, but I talked to one Vietnamese person via social media." It's like, "Cool, so you just admitted to tokenizing." Like, "Great." Like, you know, just just respect respect our cultures, respect our foods, like even if it's different. Like, you know, just don't don't like be insensitive and don't spit out that delicious mochi like in front of your friend's face like I will happily eat that mochi like that's delicious you know just be open-minded like stop uh yeah. stop just like making us seem like we're just like a bunch of aliens like with like weird like antennas or something like we're not this is our, this is like historical stuff like our food is based in history and culture and it's so important to us and like we want to share that but please do it respectfully please don't support the places yeah. that are blatantly appropriating our stuff and support asian-owned businesses like yeah yeah and i think like the question might come up like well how do i differentiate those businesses you know and so like i think a good way to know is like if you are if you are eating at a restaurant, I mean, I think it's more common in Bozeman. Like, if you were to go to a restaurant in California, most likely the chances are it's owned by a family that you know is identifying with the culture of that food. But like here in Bozeman, like I think it's very important to kind of do the research on these businesses that you're supporting because your money goes somewhere. And so, I think taking the time to like read like what is this business like what is like their mission what are their values like if it's a restaurant like what inspired them to create this restaurant are they giving back the proceeds to like the recipes that they're getting them from like who like who are they getting the recipes from who are they giving back to and I think like another thing that was very hurtful is like here in the Bozeman I don't know if Francis talked about this already but here in the Bozeman community like a lot of these restaurants like who are, who are like you know 
you know, have food that are Asian or like Asian style food, like during the rise of AAPI hate said nothing, yeah. you know, there was yeah. no, there was like, you're making money off of our food mm -hmm. or the culture of the food that you're like, you know, making profit off. And you didn't even say anything about like, Hey, like we're here to show solidarity. We're like, we're here to, we're going to put a portion of our proceeds to stop AAPI hate organization or the yellow whistle or like something like that. Nothing. And so Nothing. that's how you can differentiate, like, what's a good business? What's a bad business? Who is, you know, actually giving the cr the credit to like where they're making their money from, you know, like those are the times that like, and I, and I think like a lot, we have a lot of power as consumers. And I think, I know a lot of people think otherwise, but we do like, especially in a small community like this, we have a lot of power and where our money goes to and like, you know, these businesses. So yeah, it's just, again, taking that initiative and taking that time to learn and that's going to be on your own time. And it doesn't take a lot of times. Like you just like, if you're thinking, oh, I want to go eat out today, read a little bit about the restaurant you're going to eat out at. Um, yeah. It doesn't take a lot of time. And yeah, I definitely also feel like I actually just recently experienced this. One of my really good friends um, was like, I've actually never had Korean food. Like, Alex, will you take me to get Korean food and explain to me the historical importance? And I was like, and like the way she worded, that's like the right way to ask is like, if you don't know, just like ask. But I think that also I definitely can relate. I think in Bozeman, especially like all these restaurants that are appropriating culture, no offense to any of the places, but um just like, and they're passing it off as authentic, which honestly really upsets me. Like yeah. things that like, I remember um, the other day, like I forgot which restaurant I went to. Um, I my, One of my friends was making a joke about a restaurant in Bozeman that like said they had like an insert Asian word donut. And I was like, that is like not a thing that like we actually eat in this country. Like that's not actually like an authentic food. And I asked one of the waiters and they were like, like, this is like, you know, super authentic. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that that's not a thing. Like I'm, I texted my dad and he was like, I've never heard of that in my entire life. And I was like, if he's never heard of it, then I'm pretty sure it doesn't, it's not a thing. And they just made it up and pretended like it was an authentic food. And I think that's the other thing is that like they, I think that the thing is that like being will, like I think especially like the owners, like I remember my friend and I got ramen at a new place in downtown Bozeman and I asked, I was like, this is actually pretty good. Like, what's the background? Um, and the guy was, I was like, he's the guy from Japan. Like, they're like, no, he's white. And I was like, he's been to Japan. They're like, no, he hasn't. He just really likes ramen culture. And there's just, there's just Asian writings and art all over everywhere. And it's like, I think that like being willing to admit that like we're the, the places fusion instead of like pretending as if it's something that I, it's not. I don't know if you guys, and I honestly would really recommend, like there's a really cool documentary on, Amazon Prime um, about, like, about chefs. And one of them is about like a famous restaurant in New York called Ivan Ramen. And I think that's a really good example of like how a white person or how someone who's not of the origin. I know Francis, you said you lived in New York. You might know what I'm talking about. He like, uh, like a properly like appreciates the culture without being disingenuous because I think that mm -hmm. there's definitely a way that you yep. can do it right. And there's a way you can do it wrong. And I feel like in Bozeman, there's not a lot of places are doing it in the right way. Because like, if you're going to make all this money off of a culture, like at least you should understand it. And, and, and I think also we're like in a beautiful place that has its own culture. Like why are, why, like, I mean, theme yourself around that. Like don't like tokenize and like use other cultures to seem exotic. I don't, I don't really appreciate that. What would, yeah, not to I do just want to check in on the time. We have about five minutes left okay. together. Were there any questions that you guys um, noted over in the Q&A that you wanted to address from our webinar attendees? I know you've actually covered um, many of them already, um, but if there were any ones in particular that you wanted to jump on and address. Yeah. Thank you, Someone Sarah. anonymous said, who cares? And I, I definitely do care about this issue. And um, I think that whoever said that I think good that they're in this in this panel but I also think that like just because the like quote unquote like the law is the law it doesn't necessarily mean I think that doing what's right is like always going to be right and so like even though there aren't maybe there isn't like a policy against like AAPI like on MSU campus or in Bozeman like city I think it's still like an important issue that we need to talk about. Um, thank you, Sarah, for highlighting the Q&A. We've had some um, comments come through and some questions come through. 
Um, my name's Corey. I'm from the Bozeman Public Library. Um, I've been keeping an eye on um, that question and answer. There is one thing that um, as a female identifying panel, um, we don't really get a male perspective is mm -hmm. if you guys have friends or any um, experiences that you can speak to about like a um, Asian male perspective um, to add to this. I think that might be interesting for some of the participants on here, um, but we do only have a few minutes, so go for it. I mean, I can I can answer I can answer that. One of my friends wanted to be here, but didn't have um, like had a class conflict. But um, especially when it, I think when it comes to like speaking about like men's experience, like one of my friends who moved from a pretty liberal place and is an Asian American man was just telling me about like how much like how violent he's experienced like the, a lot of the racism. Like I luckily don't feel like I've experienced it, but just like people on the streets like using racial slurs which is just kind of terrifying to me but even in Bozeman like Francis was saying like we live in a liberal area but it's like just because you don't like you don't experience doesn't mean it doesn't happen and I think that it's it's quite like I think that the experience because like um for Asian American men can be like a lot like a lot different but I think also when it comes to things like art like the Mikado like um I think it's important to also realize like the inherent like asexualization of Asian men when it comes to a lot of this discrimination um, as opposed to the sexualization of Asian women. And I think that does like have like an extreme effect upon like the different types of like discrimination. Like I can't attest, I'm not, I don't identify as male, like I can't attest to like what kind of experiences like someone who's an Asian man experience, like does go through in Montana, but I definitely do feel like it has a lot of different undertones than those like of people who identify as female. Yeah, I think yeah. that desexualization is really um, something that Asian men here do experience just from conversations that I've had with my Asian male friends or Asian male identifying friends. And in the broader, like outside of Bozeman too, um, you know, people perceive Asian men as weak um, I think that's the kind of desexualization part is that, you know, Asian men are perceived to be like not as ma masculine or whatever it might be. And I know I've heard and, you know, I, I've had friends who've shown me this who um, have been on dating sites like Grindr, for example, which is uh, one for um, gay identifying gay identifying men is that uh, there's like something that people say that basically says no, no Asians. Um, that people that's pretty common on that dating app. Um, so I know that that's definitely a problem. Um, and that, you know, I can't speak to the experiences necessarily here in terms of violence or whatever, but I assume that people are being aggressive to Asian men too, because of that desexualization and kind of depersonalization of Asian men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I, again, like kind of as everyone was saying, I can't speak for anyone's experiences, but from the experience I've have heard, it seems like a lot of the occurrences tend to be more physical, it's like, it's in a physical, like physically violent realm of racism um, and discrimination, it seems like, and it does happen for women as well, but from my own experiences, from what I've heard from Asian American men, is that they tend to be like, whether you're at a bar and somebody calls you a slur and then they punch like a another guy punches them in the face because there's this assumption that Asian people as a whole are passive, they're submissive, they're not gonna fight back. Um, it's like all of those racial stereotypes and then it's transcribed into people's actions. And like all these stereotypes are stereotypes that are perpetuated in media. And the thing about media is that media doesn't fall that far from what you know we see in society and what we see in media transcribed into our actions and the way we, we go about our daily lives. And so, when the media perpetuates these ideas that, you know, Asian women are like highly sexual, they're, you know, all, all those stereotypes that we were talking about recently. And then the stereotype for men is that, oh, they're passive, they're weak, they're, you know, this, these, they're ace, they have these asexual, like they're not as sexual and like things like that. Like that's going to perpetuate in the way that people think and see and treat Asian men. Um, and so I think, I mean, this is a no whole nother issue, like another topic, but like toxic masculinity and how that affects Asian American men. Um, and, it, and it tends for my, like, again, I can't speak for their experiences, but from what I've seen, it seems to be a lot more violent in terms of getting punched in the face or, you know, being called a racial slur. And then and next, you know, you're having a whole physical fight, um, situations like that. 
can I answer another question? Um, uh, the question was any key takeaways you hope the audience to um, solidify um, to memory? Um, I think, you know, the biggest things that we did talk about um, was, yeah, being okay with being uncomfortable, um, using your, your voice, your privilege, and to privilege, start looking into yourself if you haven't already, to start looking at the different components of your life that do um, lift you um, with that privilege. Um, and yeah, just educate yourself. Um, that is a commitment, cultural humility, um, lifelong commitment to learning about all these different amazing cultures um, within um, within our community. Um, and Bozeman, predominantly white, you may not know <laughs> um, an Asian person, but that's okay. Like you don't have to in order to be an ally um, to the greater community. You can be an ally on a greater scale. Um, and um, yeah, that's something that, and intersectionality, that's a big, big part. <laughs> That was a really, um, I think, great way and really poignant way to end this um, session tonight. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there's one more um, webinar in this series next week on Monday, um, the same time at 6 p.m. with members of the Asian um, Opera Alliance, which will focus more on the Mikado. And then the final quote that we will um, leave you with um, it goes to Intermountain Opera's credit that they rejected the stereotypes for the Montana Mikado. So this webinar will be posted on Wednesday on the Bozeman Public Library's YouTube channel. Um, and we have our past webinars on there as well um, that also include a link to resources where people can learn more. So I think we can add some of the resources mentioned this evening, just in case people want to see this list and use this list um, for the future. But thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, be well out there. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Have so a good much. evening. Good night.